Good worship, huh? Leads right into where God wants us to be this morning. I want you to just bow your heads right with me right now to just offer up a word. God, everything that we have, we give to you. And we need you right now in a very special way to speak to us, to speak through me, to have your spirit mm, do what we cannot. We thank you ahead of time for your promise that when we seek you, we will find you, when we seek you with all our hearts, and we're doing that today. And so I ask that when we walk out of here, we'll know that we have been with you, that your spirit has been with us, and we're closer to you because of it. We thank you in your name. Amen. All right, John 12. Open up your Bibles to John 12. Thus far, verses chapters 1 through 12, uh, chapter 1, verse 19 through 12, verse 50, we have Jesus revealing who he is, revealing to the Jews, revealing to uh, the religious, religious rulers. He had been revealing all along that he was sent by the Father. He was one with the Father. He is our light. He is the Messiah. And he's come to save, not to condemn. But in every juncture that he talks and, and something is coming up, it seems over and over we hear, my time is not yet. My hour is not now. It's not yet time for me to be revealed. It's not yet time for God to do his work. And for the first time, finally, after 12 chapters, for the first time, we hear Jesus say, what does he say in John 12, 23? The hour has come. The hour has come. My time is now. It's now the pinnacle, the fullness of why he's here. God will be fully revealed from here on out. His mission will be clearly seen. And when we look through chapter 12 and subsequent chapters, what are we going to find? We're going to find the fulfillment of his earliest statement, John chapter 3, for God so loved the world that he gave. So loved the world that he gave his life, his everything, that whosoever Anyone, all, whosoever believes, who trusts, who follows him, will have life, the eternal quality, eternal quantity of life. It's a chapter that we're going to see about extravagant love and all in for others type of giving. Now, throughout this chapter, there's some contrasts. There's contrast between those who have extravagant love, who are all in for giving to others, and those who are not so much in it for love who are more in it for giving to themselves. We have Mary versus Judas. That's going to be our first contrast that we're going to face. We have those who believed and sought after Jesus, Jews and Greeks alike, as well as those who didn't believe and wanted to destroy what they saw, the religious leaders, chief priests and Pharisees. And then we find at the end the contrast of what people wanted Jesus to be. They wanted him to be the conquering, take over the world kind of king, Accomplishing their purpose for their gain versus who Jesus really was. The king that was coming to fulfill God's purpose, a love for others focus. So we're going to start with Mary. Mary, this, to this story you guys know so well. The story of when Jesus, he returns to Bethany before the Passover. Bethany was just outside of Jerusalem. And Bethany, Bethany was sanctioned as the approved spot for overflow traffic. So Jerusalem had so many people. It's estimated at one time that there were 247,000 lambs that were slain during Passover. Try not to think about the details of that. But that's a lot of people, especially when you see that every lamb, there had to be a minimum of 10 people per lamb to share in the feast. So 247,000 lambs times 10 at a minimum, you have a lot of people. So Jerusalem couldn't hold them all, so they said, well, Bethany is going to be the overflow city, so go there. And so that's where Jesus went. And he went, of course, to his favorite house, the house, well, we don't know for sure. It just says that Lazarus, Martha, and Mary were there at this house where he was dining. And we have the story here where Jesus then, he's at dinner in Jesus' honor. Martha was serving as she does best. Lazarus was among them who had just been raised and resurrected from the dead, reclining at the table with them. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard. That doesn't sound very nice. Pure nard, it was from a Himalayan plant. This rich amber oil that was extremely fragrant. An expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped 
his feet with her hair. Did they not have linen rags back then? Why would she wipe with her hair? And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. So here's Mary. Mary, who may have been at this point the only one who had any clue or believed what Jesus had been talking about. He references later when, when Judas tries to counter her beautiful act with what the what are you doing? And Jesus says, leave her alone. She's doing this for my burial. She saved it. Now she's doing it early. Somehow, Mary, when Jesus talked of death, she believed him. When he spoke of his death coming, she must have been one of the ones that got it. She sat at his feet and soaked in his words. She knew his heart closer than probably anybody did. And here she saw him resurrect her own brother from the dead. She believed when Jesus spoke. Word on the street was they were trying to kill him. This is someone that Mary loved dearly. And so she realized his time was short. The way he lived and the way he loved, he wasn't going to be around very long, which meant her time was short to show him. He had loved her abundantly, loved her abundantly, and she wanted to show her love and gratitude the best way she could, giving all she had. Now, typically, to show honor to someone by pouring oil, as you hear in the Psalms, you pour, you know, you anoint my head with oil. It was the honorable thing to do. If you wanted to honor someone, you go up and you anoint their head with oil. But Mary, I can only assume, looking at the commentaries, when you anoint the feet instead of the head, it's as if it's to say, I am not even worthy to assume that I could give you honor. I am not even worthy of that. And so in her humility, I can only get to your feet. Let me just anoint your feet and please take this. And so she pours out this perfume as if she's not good enough to be in any higher position, but she wants to be as close as she possibly can. And so she pours out this perfume onto him. But I think as I'm reading this story, I think there was more that she wanted him to know, more than her amazing, generous love. Because why didn't Mary do this in private? There were plenty of times we seem to catch throughout the stories leading up to this that Jesus would hang out with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Why didn't she wait for a more opportune time when it was just Jesus and the three of them? That she could still have honored him. She could still have shown her extravagant love. The perfume fragrance all over the house, that was going to be pretty... Uh, just opening the bottle would have caused a whole bunch of attention to come to her. Why did she wait until they're all at dinner to pour the oil of perfume on him? My thinking is perhaps, besides the tremendous thanks and honor, I think it's possible that there is this boldness in her that wanted him to know, no matter what, no matter what, I want you to know I am boldly with you. No matter what, she chooses to do this publicly, chooses to wipe the feet with her hair, which was openly rebelling against the norm, completely against what was allowed or proper for women. To have their hair down at all was not cool. She was openly rebelling against this as if conveying, I want you to know that I love you beyond what is proper and right and acceptable from all these others who want to condemn you. I love you passionately. I am all in for you, Jesus. Whatever there is of me to give to you, I want you to have. I give my money, I give my reputation, I give my whole self to serve you. I don't care what others will think. I do not care what others will think. I'm with you. I know I'll be misunderstood by what I do. I know I'll be attacked. I'll be slandered. I'll be accused wrongly just as you are receiving. But I don't care because I want you to know that I stand with you. I will defend you. I will honor you. You are not alone. You will never be alone no matter what, even to death. I will be here for you, loving you and with you. I imagine for Jesus, someone who at every turn is having people slander him, abandon him, all the turmoil, the incredible darkness that he's about to face, the feeling alone and the struggling. I imagine having this experience of someone so boldly in front of everyone pouring out this kind of love, this extravagant gesture of appreciation and complete in it with you. I can only imagine that when he faced what he had to do, when he faced all the pain and all the abandonment, the senses remember, the perfume, 
the touch of the hair, the visual of this all-out dedication and completely loyal follower of his. It must have been something that would have come to him and given him great courage and great support, knowing that he is not alone, no matter what. The question that came to me as I'm reading this is, is there anyone in my life, is there anyone in your life who needs to have that kind of all-out support in their life from you? Who in your life is going through a tough time that needs to know, devil may care, I don't have that attitude. I will boldly state, no matter what, I stand by you, I applaud you, I support you in your trial as much as I can. You are not alone. Who is that person in your life that needs to hear that from you? We don't have Jesus physically in the human body here and now, but he said that whenever we show love to the least of these, we've shown it to him. Who needs to know from you that they're not alone? They're loved when the whole world may abandon them or feels like it, you're going to be there. Last night, we had the youth over to our house, and um, we looked at the Luke version of this story, and it came to the point of saying, okay, she gave all she could at that moment. And so I asked the youth, what is it, who is in your life that needs to know? Just the question I asked you. And we had cards. We had blank cards, and they chose someone, whoever it was, that God had nudged them in their hearts and wrote notes, either notes of thanks and gratitude for what they had done in their life or notes of support of saying, whatever you're going through, I'm here with you. So they wrote cards last night, what will you do? When God brings that name to mind, what will you do with that to show that love and support? The really cool thing about Mary is that when she had an idea, when she had something come into her spirit, she didn't put it off. She took advantage of the moment, whether it's to spend time with Jesus, as we saw in previous stories of her at the feet of Jesus, whether to spend time with him listening instead of doing her chores, or doing something big, huge, generous, extravagant, like pouring out this perfume on his feet in front of everyone. She did it. She didn't let time pass. And that was Jesus' point, too, when he says, Leave her alone. You always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. And so he says, there is a time, and there is an only a little bit of time left with me. Let her do what she's called to do. Life is uncertain for all of us. We don't know how and when our time is up. We don't know how much time we have, but there are words that need to be spoken. There are actions that need to be shown. And I don't think we should ever deny or resist or delay doing big love or showing or sharing little love. We will never, ever regret, never, ever regret an act of love and genuine, authentic giving. We will have remorse when we hold it back and don't give it and it's too late. I'll never forget when I was five, six years old, I came into my house and my mom was on her knees crying in the lap of her aunt. And I remember holding back and listening in a little bit on what she was crying about. She, my mom, was lamenting. When she was 16 years old, her mom died. And her mom was like in her 30s, early 30s. And when she, um, when she had left earlier that day, they had had an argument. And my mom had spat some words out to her mom and left the house. And that day, before she came back, her mom had passed away. And there were times throughout my mom's life that that would come back to haunt her, that those words were the last words that her mom heard. Now, they, you know, she had to come to terms with that and forgive herself and all that, but my gosh, if we learn anything from Mary, it's don't put off what we know, what God is nudging us to do today in showing love, big or little, extravagant or the bare minimum. Show it, tell it, give it. Don't assume people know. Don't think there will always be time. It's time to love now. It's time to give now. It's time to live now. And when we do, I think life, just like that perfume going out and all the fragrance of the house, our lives will be more fragrant with that love. And the lives that we give it to will be more fragrant because of that love. Who is that person? In contrast, we have Judas. Judas. Good old Judas. Poor Judas gets the rap for everything. 
says one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. John commentates here. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. And that's when Jesus says, leave her alone. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. In contrast, we have extravagant love, and now we have extravagant bitterness. We have resentment. We have cynical criticism that probably crushed poor Mary's spirit, depreciated the value of Jesus by denying the value of this gesture. What a contrast, extravagant love to miserly self-focused love. And Jesus' response, let her be. It's interesting how Judas, how is it possible that he could look on such an extravagant act of love and call it extravagant waste? How is it that it's possible? Except a person's perspective, how they see what's happening around them depends on what's inside of them. The source of life and wisdom and sight comes from within. And as I read that, it's so easy to say, man, he was such a jerk. But how often do we find ourselves critical of someone else? How often do we find ourselves condemning in some form, whether in our minds or in our words, attributing negative motives to someone before actually checking? And perhaps in looking at Judas' and, and Jesus' response to him, perhaps it's time for us to stop examining them when we're in that mode, and perhaps we need to examine ourselves instead to see what's going on in our own insides. And perhaps there may be more of a need for ourselves to fill up with a different kind of spirit when it doesn't condemn but seeks to love like Mary, like Jesus. And when we fill up with that, then what can come out is not condemnation, not criticism, not crushing of people's spirits, not attributing negative emotions, but seeing their best and seeking their best through it all. We have verses that follow 9 through 11 that shows our next contrast. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus, as if that's just an option to have. You just, well, we need to kill him as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. Now, it's kind of shocking. The chief priests, these are our religious rulers who don't like what they see. And so not only are they going to kill Jesus, now they're going to kill Lazarus as well. Sounds like a crime movie or something that's building here. Chief priest, do you guys remember the definition of a priest? A bridge builder, bridge builder to God. They're kind of destroying some bridges here, wanting to destroy God. When you look, though, a little closer as to why they would have such motives, then you see a little bit historically why they might and who they were. The chief priests came from the group of Sadducees. The Sadducees. These were the wealthy aristocracy. The Sadducees, so all the chief priests were a part of the Sadducees sect, and the two reasons that they would have to destroy is politically and theologically. So politically, they, as the chief priests, they were given permission by the Roman government to rule. They were given permission to rule as long as they kept peace, as long as there were no rebellions going on, as long as they didn't disrupt what the Romans wanted to do, as long as they collaborated well with the Roman government, then they got to keep their position of power, of comfort. And so the chief priests would do anything possible to squelch any possible rebellion that might disrupt their position of power and authority. And so here they see Jesus that is gathering a whole bunch of people rallying to his cause, and they're saying, no, this, this can't happen. Well, then theologically, the other side of it, unlike the Pharisees, the Sadducees, chief priests, did not believe in the resurrection. And so they did not teach the resurrection to their people, did not teach it. But then here all of a sudden is this man called Lazarus who has been resurrected from the dead. And now people are coming to see him and to verify if this is indeed true. And so this threatened their teaching, it threatened their influence, and again, it threatened their power control. So they needed to destroy the evidence, which happened to be Lazarus. Now, they never, as far as I know, actually went through with it, but they certainly contemplated it. Quite a contrast. 
When self-interest and self-preservation drives us, drives our decisions rather than love for others, it might be time to take a pause. It might be time to take a pause. Well, Jesus was confronted with these same challenges, to love and live for others or to focus on immediate gain for self. He certainly had ample opportunity to experience a bit more of the comfort, power, and position that was available to him, especially as he was heading into Jerusalem. When he was heading in, he got on this donkey and he started heading into town. Jesus had never been so popular in all his life except at this moment. He had raised Lazarus. Crowds were gathering and cheering his miraculous signs. Even the Pharisees in verse 19, they note that... um, Verse 19, so the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere, all these crowds coming in. Look how the whole world has gone after him. So everyone's seeing how popular Jesus is. His worst enemies were completely powerless to stop him. So opportunity was at his door to take a hold and really make something of this. And what would he do with it? Well, the crowds made it very clear by what they chanted The crowds made it very clear what they wanted him to choose. The people had in mind exactly what they needed, what they wanted, and what would make them happy. When they shouted the words, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the king of Israel. Hosanna, the word means saves, saves now, save now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the king of Israel. Basically, they were chanting, God save the king. Now, they're shouting this to Jesus riding on a donkey coming into Jerusalem where the governors are ruling. They have their own king. They have their own rulers and controllers. They don't want someone else being a whole crowd of people saying, God save the king. Well, we go even further into this. The words, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord from Psalms 118, 25 through 26, pretty significant words. Besides, when a a boy starts to memorize scripture and he starts to come of age, this is like the first passage that he learns to memorize. It was also these words were used at the Feast of the Tabernacles. They were sung as part of the ritual and ceremony. But the most important part about these words that's significant here is that these words were sung for conquerors. These words were specifically sung for someone who was going to be conquering. For instance, about 100 years earlier than this time period right here, when Simon Maccabeus was returning from having conquered and broken free from the Syrian domination. This is what the Jerusalem people shouted to him as he entered into the city again. This was what they said, you are our conqueror, you are our deliverer, and this is what these words meant. So when Jesus hears them shouting these words upon his entry, he knows exactly what they're wanting. A deliverer, a messiah, one that they would waited for to have victory over Rome, to set them free, to establish the kingdom that would never die. Throughout the Old Testament, there's reference after reference about the the line of David, the kingdom of David will live forever and ever, will rule forever. All these eternal references. And so here finally was going to be our savior who was going to take over the Romans and set us free. And time was now. And then when they see him riding on a donkey... They're saying this is perfect. That's what kings do. They ride on donkeys. Our donkeys today, we don't have such high esteem of them. We call people bad names with donkey words. (laughs) But, But back then, when people chose to make a triumphal entry, they found a donkey or donkey colt and would ride in on it. Of course, they were so wrapped up apparently in their fervor for Jesus to come and be the king they forgot the whole thing that when you, and you've heard this, when a king is riding on a horse, he's bent on war. He's coming for war. That was a sign. I'm here to fight now and to take over. But when he's riding on a donkey, it's a signal I'm coming in peace. Well, Christ had a choice, of course, the pressure of the crowd, their desire to be saved now, immediately versus longer vision. It must have pressed on him immensely. After all, Jesus could have done a lot. He could have set them free from the Roman rule. That was certainly needed. It was good, but Jesus knew the difference between good and best, between an agenda for man versus an agenda of God's. And so he made it clear from what he chose to ride on into Jerusalem, he made it clear where his agenda sat on God's side. I'm not here to conquer. I'm not here to rule. I'm here for peace. But the people missed it, whether they're blind to their own desire or they thought perhaps Jesus, being new to this, maybe he got his signals, symbols messed up a little bit. Horse, donkey, one or the other, at least he's a king. 
says in the Bible that John says the disciples didn't even catch on until later what was going on in that whole mix up. Well, they started to get a clue when Jesus started to share how this was going to go down. Before we go there, I want to show this cool interplay with words, though. When you go back, when the whole crowd is coming in, they're entering in, the crowd was with them, they're calling out, they're cheering, they're talking about Lazarus. Verse 19, the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. We mirror the words, of course, from John 3, God so loved the world. But right after John writes, verse 19, look how the whole world has gone after him. The very next verse he writes in 20 is now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. It's like here's the whole world and it's starting right now. The whole world is indeed going after him. God came to save the whole world. God came because he loved the whole world. And here comes the whole world. These Greeks that came, which I have missed this verse every time I've read this chapter, here, these were the first representatives of those who had come seeking Jesus from outside the Jewish realm. And they come asking, we would like to see Jesus. They go to Philip, we want to see Jesus. It's interesting, why would the Greeks be there? Well, one theory is that they were proselytes. They had converted over to Judaism, and now they were coming to worship and be a part of the feast, the Passover. Except if they truly had been proselytes, if they truly had been converted to Judaism, they would have been referenced as Jews then. Because when you get baptized, go from the Gentile world and become Jewish, you have, it's as if you're a whole new person. And they reference you then, you are a Jew. You had no life before. So I don't think they would refer, John would still refer to them as the Greeks. But what's interesting is that when they came, they were doing what Greeks were known to do. They were known, they had a reputation for wandering the world after knowledge. The Greeks had a reputation for seeking after truth. Herodotus, Herodotus, 500 years earlier than this event, had traveled the world, simply he wrote, to find things out. There was an ancient statue in Egypt that was from hundreds of years previous to that, and they found a little carving with Greek letters on it, kind of like the first vandalism, we were here. This is what the Greeks did. They traveled around learning philosophies, learning religions, trying to find truth. And what's interesting, they never rested till they found it. One theory is that the Greeks, as they traveled, they were traders. They had to have a business as they went along. So one theory, which is kind of interesting, is that perhaps these Greeks had been part of the selling of doves in the temple courts. They have a Gentile court where anyone who wasn't Jewish could come. That's where the, the animals were sold for your sacrifices. Well, perhaps these Jews had been in there when Jesus cleared the temple. Now, John puts the clearing of the temple at the beginning of his ministry. The other Gospels puts it at the end. It's likely that happened at the end. John wasn't much concerned about time frames. But perhaps they saw this man, this rabbi, clearing access to this God, clearing access, making the, all the obstacles go away so people could have direct contact with God. And they're saying, this is a truth we want to know more about. Jesus' response it's interesting when he responds and he expresses to the disciples when they come to him and saying the Greeks are coming. His reply, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies or remains only a single seed, but if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant will also be. Whoever serves me, whoever serves me, will follow me, and where I am, my servant will also be. I'm going to get back to the whole colonel dying thing. But when the Greeks come, part of Jesus' reply is anyone who comes to serve me, who follows me, will be with me. I have come for the world, for the world. Do you and I believe that anyone can serve Jesus? Do you and I believe that even people who are far different from you and I can serve Jesus? 
that he can use them, that he'd want them to be where he is truly and fully. What about people who make different moral choices than you? What about people who have different lifestyles than you? What about people who have different political views than you? Can they truly serve Jesus too? Does God want them and what they offer too? Or in our minds, it's only if they serve like I serve, or it's only if they make the same choices that I make, only if they look and sound exactly like me, can I consider that they are truly following after God. When challenged by thinking that someone can't be doing God's work if it looks different than you, their lifestyle, their religion, their politics, we have to be careful. We have to be careful. We know in Scripture it says that man looks on the outward person, but God sees the heart. We're called not to judge, but to serve as he calls us. Not as he calls the other person, but as he calls you and as he calls me. We're supposed to serve for the purposes God gives in our life and let God be God with the other person's life, whether it's in their religion, in their politics, in their choices of life. We're called to love, to serve, to bless with our words and with our actions. No matter how polar opposites we may be, there are Greeks among us today. Greeks among us today. There are people so different yet are seeking in all their journey to follow after God, to seek after God, to make a difference in this world for God. And it doesn't always end up looking like your view of how that should look. And I think that we look at Jesus' words and he, when, when Philip and, and um, Andrew come to him and say, hey, these Greeks want to see you, he's like, bring them. Because anyone who wants to serve who follows after me will be with me. The first words out of Jesus' mouth, I think the Jews would have been very, very excited about. The hour has come. The hour has come, and they're thinking, yes, the hour for conquering, the hour for freedom, the hour for power. And then the rest of what he says would have left them rather shocked and wondering what was going on. Because Jesus doesn't go into conquering language after that. He goes into sacrifice and death. We just read about if a kernel of, kernel of seed falls, a wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternity. Here's the essence. Only by death comes life. We have seen this throughout our lives. It's only when men and women have been prepared and are willing to die for what they believe in that great things have been produced and given to us in life. Whether it's in times of war, in matters of science and discovery, in exploring and making new headway into new lands and territory, whether it's on land or in the, in the space, it's only when one sacrifices themselves, their own comforts, their own personal gain, that there is gain for all. The great illustration of using a seed, of taking wheat, when you have just, you, you know, a, just a single seed of wheat, I don't know what you call it, a single kernel of wheat. One little tiny, it's very cool looking. I, in Montana, we had lots of wheat fields, and we'd grab a whole bunch of these kernels, and they would just stay in your hands, and they'd look so cool, and you'd, you'd run your hands through them, and they'd sift them out. Then you'd take a handful, and you'd chew them, and you'd make wheat gum, and it was very fun. And these little seeds were beautiful. And you have a whole silo of them. And it's great. They stay contained. They're all in their single shell, safe, secure, comfortable. And that's about all you can do is look at them, sift them, touch them, chew them. But they remain a single seed. But when you bury that seed, when you bury that kernel into the ground, when it goes under the weight of the earth, when it's placed where it's not so clean, it's not so cool, it gets dirty and they have to contend with bugs and worms. When you put the seed into the ground, when it's taken into dark places and the forces of nature start to work on its shell, what happens to that seed? It gets broken. The forces of nature work on that seed and it breaks it. It breaks it open. It breaks it down. And then and only then does life happen out of that seed. Then and only then when in the dark when in the thick of dirt, when it's broken, 
when it's sacrificing its perfect life shell, it goes from being a beautiful single seed to something that produces more and more life. The shell's broken. A shoot springs up. It pushes through the dirt. It goes above the ground. It becomes a blade. And then a whole ear of wheat containing many, many grains of wheat, that starts to produce. And then when they experience their own deaths, they'll produce more, and the seeds break into many grains, and those seeds and grains become bread, and then the bread is broken and it's eaten and gives more life. And the cycle continues. Death produces life. It is a... It is a law of nature. Unless something dies, it remains a single seed. But a promise is always attached. If it dies, then there are many seeds. Dying to life. When we give up what is comfortable sometimes for us, when we give up focusing on remaining perfect and comfortable and in on ourselves, it's when that comfort can be brought then to others, to many in life is given beyond what our single life could do. There's a story by O. Henry that you probably have heard. It's about Jim and Della in the early 1900s. And it's a story of sacrificial love. They're a couple that lives in this modest apartment. They have two possessions between them that they take great pride in. Della has this amazing, beautiful, long, flowing hair that almost touches to her knees. And Jim has a shiny gold watch, which had belonged to his father and his grandfather. Well, it's Christmas Eve, and there's only $1.87 in hand. Desperate to find a gift for Jim, Della goes out. She sells her hair for $20 to a nearby hairdresser named Madame Sofroni, and eventually finds a platinum pocket watch fob chain for Jim's watch for $21, exactly what she has. Satisfied she's found the perfect gift for Jim, Della runs home and begins to cook dinner for him. Well, at 7 o'clock, Della sits at a table near the door, very excited, waiting for Jim to come home. Unusually late, he walks in, and immediately he stops short as he looks at Della. She had really prayed that he would still find her pretty. And so Della admits that she had to sell her hair so she could buy a present for him. And then Jim turns and gives Della his present for her, and it's an assortment of these beautiful expensive hair accessories that are useless now that her hair is short. Della then shows Jim the chain she bought for him, to which Jim says he sold his watch to get the money to buy her combs. So although Jim and Della are now left with gifts that neither one can use, they realize how far they are willing to go to show their love for each other and how priceless their love really was. That's what Jesus, I think, was talking about when he talks about sacrifice. It's only by spending our lives that we keep it. It's only in dying that we live. We all can hoard life. We can hold on to our money. We can hold on to our time. We can hoard ourselves, all of our good things that come primarily to ourselves. But the reality is is that we lose out on living fully when we focus on keeping things for ourselves. We may exist longer in life. We may remain comfortable for longer. We may take things easily, avoid sacrifice, not being touched by the troubles or the cares of the world. We may exist longer, but we will not live. We will not live fully. It's ironic because it seems that the opposite is true, but to die is to have life, but the wisdom of God is the foolishness of man. And the truth of nature remains in the physical world and the spiritual world, the world of our heart and the world of our spirit. When we're ready to sacrifice, to intentionally seek to give of ourselves for others to live as Jesus lived, only then will we truly experience life and living as it was intended to be by God. With abundance, fullness, deeply and joyfully. Jesus chose this way to the very end. To the very end of his life, he refused, refused to stop loving. He refused to stop sharing the way to life, refused to stop serving and blessing others, even when people were seeking to kill him because he was threatening their systems. He refused to stop loving and doing whatever he could to bring others to see who God really is last scene of chapter 12 are the hero final words John records that the final words of Jesus are these words of the final chapter of of 12 
the final words of Jesus to a crowd of people. And his final words, it was like his last plea to the people before he ended up going in his final week to death. But he risks one more chance to let people know that when you see me, when you hear me, you will meet God. And when you meet God and when you hear God, you aren't ever going to hear condemnation, but you're going to hear love. You won't find judgment, but you're going to find life here and now and always. And as his seed died so that there could be life, he passed it on to you and I. That as he gives us opportunities, as he calls us to love in the face of challenges, to live fully for others, he said that you too will have that life and you will give that life to others so they can live forever in eternal kind of life with God. I think that's why we are here. We gather every week to be reminded of this God of great love. So when we are in our dark times, we know that we're not alone. In our dark times, we know that he's working on us to give a life beyond ourselves that others can live as well. Hope we do him glory and honor. Our God will meet all of our needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory for